Hey, hi everybody. So this is another lecture in my podcast series. It's lectures from the medical genetics module, obviously, and it deals with non-coding RNA. So before we get into details, let's just give a brief overview of what we're going to be talking about in the lecture today. So we're going to start by considering the concept, the idea of RNA functioning as a regulatory molecule. So thus far in the degree, whenever you've encountered RNA, it's likely to be um, in the context of RNA being either an intermediate, such as messenger RNA, or perhaps a structural molecule, such as the types of RNAs that we may find in protein complexes, such as the ribosome. Today we're going to consider recent findings, findings from the last 10 years or so, which have uncovered an incredibly detailed and complex role for RNA as a regulatory molecule. That story is going to be be begin really by looking at one of the properties of RNA that make it such an interesting molecule in the first place, and that's its structural flexibility. The propensity for RNA to form secondary structures with itself. And the formation of such structures can, in itself, lend function after a fashion to RNA as a molecule. And we'll consider some examples of how secondary structure within RNA can directly regulate and affect gene expression. We're going to, then going to move on to uh, the so-called um, short and long non-coding RNAs. And it's these molecules in particular that the lecture is going to focus upon. So short and long non-coding RNA represent a real step change in our understanding of how gene expression is controlled and regulated <clears throat> not only in high eukaryotes but across all, organ all organisms as we'll see <clears throat> we'll discuss in length RNA interference which if you like is the mechanism by which these short non-coding RNAs are able to affect gene expression and then we'll talk towards the end of the lecture about long non-coding RNAs which we've known about for a long time now but only very recently begun to appreciate their functional significance with regards to cell biology. So the learning outcomes for this lecture then are to develop a knowledge and understanding about RNA structures, regulate gene expression, develop a knowledge and understanding of small regulatory RNAs, and in particular microRNAs, which we're going to look at in quite a lot of detail with regards to their synthesis, processing and role in biology. You'll need to develop knowledge and understanding of the RNA interference pathway, the mechanism by which these non-coding RNAs are able to um, impact on gene expression control. And you're also going to develop knowledge and understanding of long regulatory RNAs. And to do this, we're going to focus on perhaps the two most uh, well understood examples of these types of molecules, which is the long non-coding RNA HOTAIR and the long non-coding RNA molecule exist. So let's think about the um, concept of RNA as a regulator of gene expression then. So when did we first start to think about <coughs> RNA in this way? Well, it stretches all the way back really to the 1950s and the 1960s. So I mentioned a couple of slides ago that it's only in the last 10 years we've become to appreciate how widespread and important regulatory RNAs are in cell biology. That's true, but the first inklings, if you like, in the scientific community that RNA might function in this way stretch all the way back to the birth of our understanding of molecular biology and gene expression, which really occurred in the 1960s. <clears throat> and it can be traced back directly to a couple of guys, um, a couple of Frenchmen uh, who were working on gene expression in bacteria in the 1960s. And these guys were Francois Jacob and um, Jacques uh, Monet. Sorry. And it was Jacques Monet who is pictured here, looking rather cool, smoking a cigarette. Nothing cool about that, kids, obviously. Um, who was partly responsible for our modern day understanding, if you like, of how gene expression is regulated. And this understanding was really born out of Monet, uh, Monet and Jacob's work uh, on the lactose operon in, in E. coli. 
So the lactose operon is something everybody in this, uh, well, everybody on the biomedical sciences course at Bradford will definitely be familiar with because I know for a fact that Dr. Ross teaches this in year two on molecular genetics. <clears throat> and it's this seminal work delineating the lactose operon pathway that really gave us our first idea that RNA could possibly be involved in a regulatory sense with regards to gene expression control. So specifically in their seminal work, which they were awarded the Nobel Prize of Medicine, by the way, a few years after its publication, uh, these two guys, Mono and Jacob, um, stip stipulate or suggest that the molecules involved in regulating expression from the lacoperon could be RNA or they could be protein. In their opinion, it was equally likely that either of those molecules could perform this task. Now, in this instance, it turned out that actually the molecules involved in regulating the lactoperon were protein in nature, were proteins. In particular, the lacai repressor protein, which you can see in this GIF here. And it was this revelation, this discovery of the lacai repressor protein and how it functioned to um, regulate expression from this operon that gave birth to the explosion of uh, work and research performed identifying other such proteins which were able to affect transcriptional control. Um, now there are many, many, many examples of such proteins. Like, um, so transcriptional uh, regulatory proteins are very widespread in biology and partly because of this and partly because of this slew of other similar proteins that were identified, the concept that RNA could also be performing tasks such as these with regards to regulating gene expression was sort of sidelined, if you like, for many years, only to be rediscovered far later on in the actual mid to late 90s. And uh, as we turned, in, uh, turned the millennia into, into the 2000s. <coughs> so we'll come back to that if you like, um, revisiting or rediscovery of RNA as a regulatory molecule in a, in a slide or two's time. <clears throat> so the concept then that RNA could possibly be functioning in a regulatory manner was laid down in the 60s. But before I get on to discussing in detail specific examples of uh, RNA molecules which can in fact uh, regulate gene expression directly, I want to give you some examples of how the actual structure of RNA itself can also lead to regulation of gene expression control. So what we've got here is a sequence of um, nucleic acid. I've been quite lazy here. I've drawn this. This is obviously DNA, as it's got thymines in it, thymine uh, nucleotides present. These would, of course, be uracil if this, if this were RNA, but it allows me to illustrate the point I want to make. I don't know if you can spot anything unusual about this sequence if you look carefully at it. It's actually not that easy to spot unless you know what you're looking for. But if you look closely at this sequence, what you will see is that elements of the sequence uh, exhibit uh, palindromic patterns. In other words, an exact reverse uh, copy of the sequence that, begins, that appears at the beginning of this run of nucleotides appears at the end of the run of nucleotides. And the presence of palindromic sequences within DNA facilitate the DNA to form structures known as stem loops. And these stem loop structures in DNA and also in RNA are very important with regards to um, conveying, well, in DNA, conveying issues around replication, such as backward slippage, etc. But also in RNA, conveying regulatory capabilities to the molecule. So let me tell, talk in a bit more detail about what I, what I mean by that. So this is a far nicer example of a palindromic um, uh, RNA this time. And as you can see here, this RNA possesses a sequence such that allows base pairing to occur between palindromic sequences that are present in the RNA molecule. And what you have form in these situations of palindromic sequences is this classical stem loop structure here. So you have nucleotide bases in the RNA here which are complementary to nucleotide bases just downstream of themselves and then a region in between 
which doesn't exhibit any kind of complementarity, which forms this loop. So this is a loop and this is a stem, which forms a so-called stem loop structure. So these sorts of structures can function in a number of ways. One of the ways in which it can function is to act as a roadblock to other molecules during transcription or translation. And whether you realise it or not, you've all encountered a direct example of this again in molecular genetics last year when discussing the tryptophan operon. So attenuation of the transcription process for that operon is achieved via secondary structures which form in the actual operon, um, the operon transcript. So I don't want to go over that old work. What I want to focus on today is the... Uh, there's another situation involving these stem loop structures which relates to the fact that they can function as binding sites or other regulatory molecules. And I'm going to give you an example of uh, where that can occur in, in uh, animal cells. But before we go on to that example, it's important that you realise that some classes of the small regulatory RNAs, which we're going to talk about in a, in a moment or in a few slides' time, also assume this structure prior to processing. And we're going to talk more about these small RNAs, these microRNAs later on. So then, let's consider an example from our cells, if you like, where um, the presence of such RNA secondary structures can affect gene expression directly. And a really nice example relates to iron homeostasis. Um, and it's not very complicated, really, this, this, this example. It, it might look it at first, but if you break it down and think about it, it's a very elegant, simplistic system um, by, by which to control uh, iron levels, basically, in, in cells. So it relates to or revolves around the presence of these stem loop structures in the actual messenger RNA for two different genes, ferritin and transferrin. So before I go into the mechanism, let me just explain what ferritin and transferrin do. So ferritin is a protein that's responsible for binding and uh, binding to and sequestering iron. So if there's too much iron present in the cell, ferritin has a, has a it's ferritin's responsibility. It's ferritin's job to bind excess iron and sequester it away so it doesn't do damage or doesn't have any toxic effect. Similarly, the second protein, transferrin is a receptor that when iron is lacking from the cell is expressed in order to import additional iron in across a plasma membrane. So in other words, if you are lacking iron in a cell, you'll want to make more transferrin receptor so you can pump more iron into the cell where it's needed. So ferritin sequesters iron when there's too much, transferrin brings more iron in when there isn't enough. And the regulation of both these proteins is controlled by a secondary structures that form in the messenger RNA for these genes transcribed gene so there's a third player involved in this regulation process and that's this protein called cytosolic aconitase and what cytosolic aconitase does is it binds to the actual hairpin loop structure that forms in the messenger RNA but it only binds to that structure in the absence of iron. So if iron is limiting, cytosolic aconitase will bind to the stem loop structure that's present in ferritin, and it will also bind to the stem loop structure that's present in transferrin. If there's excess iron present, the iron, excess iron molecules interact and bind with cytosolic aconitase, causing it to be released from these stem loop structures. So how exactly does the binding and release of cytosolic aconitase then have an effect on the gene expression of ferritin and transferrin? Well, one thing you may have noticed, those of you who look carefully at these sorts of things on slides, is that the stem loop structure in ferritin is present in the 5' prime region of the messenger RNA. It's actually present in the 5' prime untranslated region of the messenger RNA. So it's present in the part of the messenger RNA upstream of the start codon. Conversely, the stem loop structure for ferritin is actually present in the three prime untranslated region of uh, the ferrit uh, sorry the transferrin messenger RNA, and that's important because consider what we were talking about briefly in the previous lectures on mRNA processing, and the fact that um, 
<coughs> and the fact that uh, regulation with regards to mRNA stability tends to involve the 3 prime untranslated region. Regulation with regards to um, altering translation tends to involve the 5 prime untranslated region. And that's exactly what's going on here. So consider a situation in the absence of iron, so when iron's limiting in the cell. So therefore, cytosolic reconnaissance is binding both of these stem loop structures. So for the case of ferritin, where the stem loop is in the 5' prime untranslated region, the presence of cytosolic econotase on this messenger RNA effectively acts as a roadblock to ribosomes. So ribosomes are no longer able to translate across this messenger RNA in order to, in order to produce protein. So no ferritin protein is made. Conversely, the presence of cytosolic econotase and the three prime end of this messenger RNA for transferrin means that the stability of the transferrin messenger RNA is greatly increased, which directly relate, results in increased amounts of transferrin protein being produced in the cell for the simple reason that the messenger RNAs that are being translated into that protein hang around for a lot longer in the cytoplasm and allow a lot more protein to be made before they're eventually degraded. So in the absence of iron, in iron starvation, no ferritin is made, and we get extra transferrin receptor made, which is exactly what we need. There's no iron, we need to have more receptors to bring iron in. We certainly don't want any ferritin sequestering what iron is, what little iron is already there. In the presence of excess iron, cytosolic econotase now no longer binds these regions. So for the ferritin messenger RNA, this protein is released from the 5' prime end. Ribosomes can then scan across this and start producing ferritin. In contrast, for the transferrin messenger RNA, in the absence of cytosolic econotase from the 3' prime end, the stability of that messenger RNA is drastically decreased. Far less, if any, transferrin receptor is actually made into protein from that messenger RNA because the RNA is so unstable. The ribosomes simply don't have a lot of opportunity to bind to and translate protein from those molecules. So when there's lots of iron around, we make lots of ferritin to sequester that excess iron. And certainly we don't want to make, and we don't make any transferring receptors to bring more iron in. There's already too much there. So it's a really elegant system based on the secondary structure of RNA that exists in order to regulate gene expression. So that's a really nice example that you want to uh, try and understand and get clear into your head. Okay, so that's how the structure of RNA can regulate gene expression indirectly. But what I want to spend the rest of the um, lecture considering is a group of molecules which are specifically produced by cells in order to directly control gene expression. And I think it's a really staggering statistic that current estimates place the number if, or percentage of our genes that are regulated by these uh, non-coding RNAs in the region of around 70%. So 70% of our genes are regulated in some way by these non-coding RNA molecules. Now what I find particularly you know, staggering about that fact is, is that up until very recently, just 10 years ago, we didn't really have any appreciation or knowledge that these molecules existed or certainly existed and were performing the functions that, the, 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 that we now know that, 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 that they do perform. So what we've got, if you like, is a completely new player in the field of gene expression control, and one that seems to you know, add at least one and arguably several layers of complexity to our understanding of how the expression of our genes is controlled. So of all the non-coding RNAs, the, probably the best understood and the most studied are a family that are termed short non-coding RNAs. And what these molecules do is they repress the expression of genes that share sequence homology to themselves. I'll explain in more detail what that means later on. So I've listed here the different types of short non-coding RNA that I want you to be aware of uh, as part of the learning outcomes for the lecture. The first are these so-called short interfering RNAs. And these short interfering RNAs are generally generated from Double strand, longer double-stranded RNA precursor molecules. I've included them here not because I'm going to discuss uh, these molecules with regards to the biology of the cell today, 
more because they're actually very important with regards to research and uh, our ability to potentially use non-coding RNA gene expression control as a therapeutic, which we'll revisit right at the end of the lecture. What I am going to spend a lot more time talking about today are these microRNA short non-coding RNAs, which I'm sure you will have heard of, if not, uh, I've spent a lot of time reading about thus far. So these microRNAs are produced from precursor RNAs encoded by genes. And I've put genes in inverted commas there because as Dr. Fessing, I believe, ex tried to explain to you in previous weeks on the, on, on the module, our definition of what a gene is or a transcriptional unit is has altered somewhat in recent years. So we no longer just think of genes as necessarily um, bits of DNA that encode for protein sequence. Genes or transcriptional units can encode for lots of different things, including non-coding, long non-coding RNAs, and other elements as well. So microRNAs are generally produced from precursors that exist in RNA that is encoded as part of genes. And we'll talk more about the structure of these microRNAs and how they're processed later on. And then a final uh, family of short non-coding RNAs I want to mention are these so-called PWE interaction RNAs, or PI RNAs. Uh, these are a family of short non-coding RNAs that are expressed in germline cells and have a very interesting mode of action and what appears to be a very important job to do with regards to monitoring the genomic integrity of the cell. And we'll talk briefly about that in a few slides of time. So of these three examples here, it's microRNAs that we're going to focus on today. And these are arguably the most important uh, member of the family from a medical and disease perspective. So let's look at microRNAs and where they come from then. So as I mentioned briefly on the last slide, microRNAs are encoded in the genome as part of longer transcripts. And a key thing about them is that they have a specific structure. And this structure is termed a primary microRNA. And the reason that this primary microRNA structure is so important is that historically it has allowed scientists to try and identify uh, microRNAs based on bioinformatic information that we had available about genomes. So let's have a little look at what this structure looks like and explain what I mean by being able to identify these things via bioinformatics. So the first part of this figure here basically is just demonstrating the fact that microRNAs can be derived from a different, uh, lots of different locations. They can be found between genes, intergenic, they can be found in the exons or the introns of coding genes. Uh, they can be found within polycystronic genes. Wherever they're found, prior to processing, these microRNA molecules appear with this classical primary microRNA structure. And as you can see, this structure is a stem loop. So this brings us back to the structural um, the structural uh, discussions we were having a few slides ago with regards to the ability, with regards to, with regards to the ability of RNA molecules uh, being able to form secondary structures based on sequence, palindromic sequence, and that's exactly what these microRNAs do here in transcripts that have been transcribed from uh, genes within the genome where, they, where where these microRNAs are found. So the reason that this particular structure then allows bio, bioinformaticians to identify potential microRNAs uh, in silico, which means basically via the computer just looking at raw RNA sequence, is the fact that they can look for palindromic sequences that exist within genome sequence data and try and model that uh, palindromic sequence in such a way that it can predict whether or not it's likely to form this sort of hairpin loop structure. Now, those sorts of studies, those bioinformatic studies, uh, are not perfect. Um, they can throw up false positives. They can claim that a particular sequence is likely to form a microRNA when it isn't. And conversely, they can give you false negatives. They can miss microRNAs, which are, in, are present in transcripts. But it certainly allowed bioinform bioinformaticians a really powerful approach with regards to trying to identify microRNAs which were existed in known transcripts. <clears throat> so, how do we get from this 
primary microRNA structure here then to a mature microRNA which is able to regulate gene expression. The first thing it says, I don't want you to worry about this part of this diagram here. This is just including for completion. So we're going to go through each of these processes and elements uh, over the coming slides. But what I do want you to appreciate is that in order for a microRNA to become active, it must undergo a series of processing events in order to generate an active, mature microRNA. And there are really two enzyme complexes which are, in, which are involved in this processing um, pathway. And those are the enzyme complexes Drosia, Drosia, whichever way you want to pronounce it, and Dysa. So what Drosia does is it actually comes along and recognises primary microRNA sequences within transcripts and snips these primary microRNA stem loops away from the transcripts in order to, the, in order to release them from this longer RNA molecule. Now the process of snipping these away from this longer transcript generates what's known then as a precursor microRNA or a pre-microRNA. And this processing, this snipping of the microRNA all away from the transcript takes place in the nucleus of the cell. Once Drosia has cleaved this stem loop away from the longer transcript, this precursor microRNA, pre-microRNA, is then actively transported across the nuclear pore via a export protein called exporting 5. So this export pathway is dissimilar to the TAP pathway we talked about during mRNA export uh, in some ways but similar in others. Exporting 5 is a TAP-like protein. It binds to the pre-microRNA and it allows it to shuttle through that nuclear pore complex past those FG repeats we talked about for mRNA transport. And then once it's in the cytoplasm, it releases the pre uh, precursor microRNA in order to get further processed. So once this transport across the nuclear pore is complete, the precursor microRNA is then cleaved once more by a second enzyme complex called DISA. And this cleavage by DISA leads to the production of a mature microRNA generally between 21 and 23 nucleotides in length, that can then enter something called the risk complex and go on to affect gene expression control. So we're going to talk about the risk complex and how that works in a second. What you need to take away from this slide is A, the structure of microRNAs when they're first transcribed, which are these primary microRNA stem loop structures, the fact that these primary microRNAs are cleaved by an enzyme complex called Drosia, in order to release a precursor microRNA. This precursor microRNA is transported into the cytoplasm by exporting 5, whereby once in the cytoplasm, it itself is cleaved by another enzyme complex called DISA, resulting in the final mature microRNA being incorporated in the risk complex. So what I want you to look at on this slide is a more detailed picture of what actually is going on with regards to cleavage of the primary microRNA and precursor microRNA by Drosia and Dysa. And what I've done is I've marked the actual cleavage positions of the uh, that occur in this microRNA on this on this diagram below. So if we look first at the cleavage by Drosia, which is marked by the red arrows, one thing that's important to notice is that cleavage by Drosia leaves a two nucleotide three prime overhang present on the microRNA. So it cleaves here and it cleaves here. This is a five prime end. So five prime all the way around as a single stranded piece of RNA to the three prime end. So the three prime end has a two nucleotide overhang present. And it's that overhang, those two nucleotides which are unpaired compared to the rest of the nucleotides in the stem of this structure that are important for the second cleavage event by DISA. DISA comes along and it recognises this two nucleotide overhang and binds to the precursor microRNA and then DISA chops the head of that stem loop off. So it chops the loop structure off by cleaving it at these nucleotides here. So once DISA's performed that cleavage, what you're left with then is a short double-stranded piece of RNA. You've lost this loop structure here and you've just been left with 21 to 23 nucleotides of double-stranded RNA. 
a couple of other features to point out. This is the mature microRNA sequence, this double-stranded 21 to 23 nucleotide um, piece of RNA that's left following cleavage by Drosia and Dicer. So when you hear the term, or if you want to use the term mature microRNA, that's what you're referring to. And another term you may come across if you do extra reading around microRNAs is the seed region. And this seed region is important because it's a seed region that actually represents the nucleotides which do the initial base pairing with the microRNA's target messenger RNA. And we'll talk about target mRNAs in a second when I explain exactly how these small RNA molecules are actually affecting gene expression control. But it's a seed region that's responsible for the initial base recognition that goes on during RNA interference. Okay, so RNA interference. So, Fire and Mello were awarded the Nobel Prize for Medicine in 2006 for their discovery of RNA interference. And it's really illustrative of how important a discovery this was. Uh, the fact that they were awarded the Nobel Prize so quickly after its publication. Normally scientists have to wait a lifetime often before the Nobel um, Committee recognised their work as being really of seminal importance, of such a fundamental importance to medicine or physics or chemistry or whatever that um, the reward, you're awarded the Nobel Prize. Uh, Higgs, for example, put forward his theory in the Higgs boson decades ago, 30, 40 years before the, you know, the Nobel Committee recognised his work. Fire and Bellow had to wait three or four years before the Nobel Prize came along. And that's indicative of a couple of things. One, just how important a mechanism our interference is. And two, just how widespread and far-reaching the implications of this discovery are for our understanding of gene expression control, but also potentially for therapeutics and other elements as well. So where did it all come from then? Where did we first start piecing together the the puzzle, if you like, that um, resulted in the identification of RNA interference as a mechanism. Well, it began by serendipitous experiments in different organisms, as is so often the case in science, and in particular, in particular, sorry, experiments carried out in the flower petunia, and uh, experiments carried out in potato virus, and also experiments carried out in C. elegans, a nematode worm. So, I think most people, if you ask. Most people would say that the, the initial, the first experiments which pointed towards RNA interference being in existence came from the work carried out in petunia flowers. And what was going on here was that there was, there was a guy working for a company in the States and his remit was to try and produce a petunia flower that had a nice deep purple colour, even more deeply purple than the petunia flowers which were already in existence. So in order to do this he thought he had a nice simple plan of action, he would find the gene which contributed the, per, the purple colour to the, to the flower, to the plant, which he did. And then he would ectopically express that gene, which produces a purple colour, from a strong promoter off of a plasmid, which he did. Unfortunately, when he did this experiment, he saw the complete opposite of what he expected. So plants which were expressing his ectopic copy of the purple gene, if you like, actually produced flowers which were white uh, in some places, and in some instances, completely white completely devoid of any colour <coughs> and this was a complete opposite to what he expected but nevertheless a very intriguing result so at a similar time people were doing experiments in C. elegans in nematode worms trying to knock down or get rid of mRNA expression for a particular gene what um, these guys were doing in order to achieve that was a, was a technique known as antisense um, RNA and antisense, which was around 15 or 20 years ago, was the mechanism of ch method of choice for trying to downregulate or deplete gene expression in, in mammalian cells. It was a very simple concept of antisense worked. You introduced an RNA molecule or a molecule that had reverse complementary sequence to a particular messenger RNA that you wanted to deplete. The idea is your complementary antisense molecule recognizes and binds to the sense messenger RNA molecule and thereby in inactivates it, prevents it from being translated to protein. And it worked reasonably well. Now, what was interesting about the particular experiment these guys did is that they did the experiment using the antisense RNA, and they saw that you got some depletion of their target gene, and they managed to restrict expression of that gene. 
And in that experiment, they also included a control. So they included a negative control, which was the sense messenger RNA. <clears throat> now, the sense messenger RNA should have had no effect on the messenger RNA that they were trying to knock down because it possessed exactly the same sequence. It wouldn't bind to the messenger RNA and, activate, and inactivate it. But intriguingly, what they saw is that they got an equally um, good knockdown of the messenger RNA target with the sense messenger RNA as well as with the anti-sense messenger RNA, which really, you know, got them scratching their heads. And the genius of um, Fire and Bellow was work was that they actually managed to put together these pieces of the jigsaw and work out what was going on. So what Fire and Bellow did is they introduced sense RNA and anti-sense RNA to C. elegans worms, which... targeted a particular gene responsible for kind of muscle filaments in the worm and they showed that the sense RNA and the anti-sense RNA actually had little effect on the expression of this muscle filament protein however when you combine the sense and anti-sense together to form a double-stranded piece of RNA what you saw then was a very clear phenotype this twitching phenotype whereby um, the microfilament protein uh, was not being produced which resulted in the worm developing this kind of twitchy phenotype. And it turns out, going back to the previous experiments in C. elegans, that the reason why the sense RNA was producing a knockdown effect in those experiments was that the actual preparation of the sense RNA contained a very small amount of antisense contaminant. And so it wasn't actually the sense RNA that was doing the knockdown. It was the fact that some very small amount of this double-stranded RNA product was being generated due to this contamination. And it was this that was actually doing the knockdown of the actual messenger RNA in those experiments. So if that's the observation of RNA interference, the fact that these double-stranded RNA molecules appear to be able to knock down gene expression or deplete gene expression, how exactly does it work at the molecular level? So as alluded to earlier on in one of the previous figures, RNA interference is achieved via a protein complex called RISC, RNA-induced silencing complex. And we talked briefly about this again last year in molecular genetics, but we're going to go into a lot more detail of this process today. So the double-stranded RNA molecules we considered on the previous page, well, they are actually precursor molecules that eventually give rise to small double-stranded RNAs, such as the short interfering RNAs we talked about at the beginning of this section. And as is the case of microRNAs, the short interfering or small double-stranded RNAs are generated by the enzyme DICER. These short RNAs, be they from uh, short interfering RNAs or from microRNAs, are then incorporated into this risk complex and then it's this risk complex which actually facilitates the targeting and the repression of translation. So that's illustrated quite nicely in these diagrams here. So what we have here is double-stranded RNA, short double-stranded RNA derived from a longer molecule. And here we have a precursor microRNA molecule. Both of these structures are recognised by DICER. DICER binds to these structures and then cleaves, in the case of microRNA, the loop structure off of the precursor. <coughs> this results in the production of this mature microRNA, which is then asymmetrically assembled into risk. So what that means is one of these strands is released, and the other strand, which is known as the guide strand, which is shown in red here, is actually incorporated into the risk complex. Once the guide strand is incorporated into the risk complex, the risk complex then can seek out the messenger RNA target, which has complementary sequence to this guide strand, and cleave that target in order to degrade the messenger RNA and shut down gene expression. And again, we'll talk more about this in a second. What we're looking at here is a 3D structure for the DICER enzyme complex. And it's got several interesting domains which you need to be aware of. The blue molecule here going through the actual protein complex is the double-stranded RNA molecule or the microRNA precursor molecule here. 
And dice is sometimes described as having um, three main domains to the protein structure. The first domain is a so-called PAS domain down here. And what the PAS domain does is it binds the RNA molecule, specifically if you remember that three prime two nucleotide overhang that we talked about earlier on. So that overhang sits within the PAS domain here. And the PAS domain holds the microRNA in position. There's then a handle region to dicer. And then a hatchet head or axe head region to the protein complex as well. And it's this hatchet head, this axe head, that actually snips and cleaves the precursor microRNA molecule in order to produce a mature microRNA that's around 21 to 23 nucleotides long. So once you've produced this mature microRNA and the guide strand has been incorporated into risk, how then does a risk complex actually lead to silencing of the target messenger RNA? Well, a key component of the risk complex is a protein known as argonaut. So argonaut itself is a multi-protein, uh, has multiple uh, sorry active sites, and is, mu uh, is a multi-domain protein, as illustrated by this cartoon here. Once again, the actual RNA molecule is held in place within risk via an interaction with the PAS domain that's present within the argonaut protein. So the three prime end of the guide RNA binds to the pocket of this PAS domain within Argonaut and that's what locks it in place within the risk complex. Once it's locked in place, target messenger RNAs then associate with this guide RNA based on sequence complementarity. And once this complementarity is established, an RNA's domain within Argonaut snips the messenger RNA that's been targeted causing it to be degraded and this snipping of target messenger RNA is termed slicer activity and slicer activity is the most widely understood and widely known example of how risk actually silences gene expression while it's the most widely understood it's not it's not exclusively the only mechanism by which argonaut can function for example, there are numerous argonaut proteins expressed in humans. I think the last count was seven or eight. And not all of these exhibit slicer activity. So this suggests and indicates that other mechanisms must exist for silencing gene expression as well, or for manipulating gene expression control. Not all argonauts simply target messenger RNAs and cut them up. And this links to a recent observation about RNA interference, um, which involves chromatin modification. So initially RNA interference was believed to solely regulate gene expression exclusively via translation, so in other words by targeting and degrading or repressing messenger RNAs. However, recent research done in the model organism Schizosaccharomyces pombi, which is fish and yeast, has shown that RNA interference can also function at the transcriptional level. So there are situations where the risk complex can be transported into the nucleus and once in the nucleus, target DNA in order to repress translation by a modification of chromatin. Transcription, sorry, by a modification of chromatin. I'm not going to say any more on that topic today, but if you want to do a little bit of extra reading about that, then you can read this article that's linked here in the presentation. You might have to go to the um, PowerPoint file on Blackboard in order to do that. Um, I've not added links into the YouTube videos yet, that's something I might do in the future. Apologies for the uh, animation on these. So RNA interference then, it involves the risk complex, a major component of that's the argonaut protein. It's argonaut that binds to the guide strand of the microRNA and then targets that guide strand to uh, messenger RNA in order to degrade it. That's all well and good, but why does RNA interference exist in the first place? Well, it's generally believed that RNA interference evolved as an ancient evolutionary conserved defence mechanism. And there's a few lines of, um, or a few 
avenues of research that support that hypothesis. The first um, of those is the CRISPR system from bacteria, which has striking similarities to the peewee RNA systems in animals, which we're going to talk about in a second. These similarities revolve around the fact that both the CRISPR system in bacteria and the peewee RNA system in animals target and silence the expression of unwanted foreign inverted commas DNA. So in bacteria, the CRISPR system is able to recognise and inactivate foreign DNA that's been placed in the cell by bacteriophages. So bacteriophages, as you show, sure you know, are like viruses for bacteria. So how does that system work? Well, it's relatively complex. There's a nice section on it in a core textbook, Molecular Biology of the Gene, if you want to read a little bit more about this. But effectively, in bacteria, when bacteriophages enter the cell, elements, small elements from the bacteriophage genome are actively acquired by a region of the bacterial genome called the CRISPR region. And these signatures, if you like, these small elements from these invading bacteriophages are then used by the bacteria to produce so-called CRRNAs, which are then able to target and downregulate future invading bacteriophages who exhibit these sequences. So that's quite a simplistic explanation. If you want to again do more reading, there's um, lots of information out there on CRISPR systems, if you've not covered them already in microbiology lecture. So how is this similar to the peewee RNA system then in our cells? Well peewee RNAs are interesting and um, as I said earlier on in the lecture they're expressed in germline cells. One of the reasons they're interesting is that it appears that they're responsible for controlling um, and repressing active transposons within our genome. So as Dr. Fessin no doubt mentioned Nearly half of our genomic sequence is actually comprised of transpose on DNA. Thankfully, the vast majority of this is inactive and it's found within heterochromatin. But every so often, excuse me, every so often transposons can become active once more and start jumping around the genome. So remember, transposons, transposable elements, are elements which are able to self-replicate, which are elements that are able to replicate themselves and then move themselves to a different location in the genome. And the reason that's a problem is if things start moving around the genome in an uncontrolled manner, it can give rise to spontaneous mutations. So therefore it's essential that the expression of these transposons is kept in check. And that's what the peewee RNA system is doing. If you think about the cells of the body which you particularly want to avoid spontaneous mutations occurring in, then the, right at the top of that list will be the germ cells, the germline cells. So it's no coincidence that it's these same germline cells which see the highest levels of peewee RNA expression. So again, if you want to read more about peewee RNA and CRISPR systems, you can refer to the core textbook and look at a bit more information in there on those, on those um, different, different mechanisms. So one of the major reasons that microRNA research is so widespread and so, uh, you know such a huge industry at the moment is because of the medical importance that we're now starting to ascribe to individual microRNAs or microRNA families. The examples I give you on this slide are limited to cancer but we now know that microRNAs are regulating all sorts of different functions in the body and have started to be associated with all sorts of different diseases particularly neurological disorders. But the examples that are most commonly found in textbooks with regards to microRNA and disease would involve cancer. And initially, like everything else, when studies in these, into microRNAs and their um, relationship to disease first began, the consensus appeared to be that actually a reduction in, RNA, in, in microRNA expression seemed to be the most commonly associated event with, 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 the, with disease, with cancer. Uh, but we now know that microRNAs can also be upregulated as well and that an increased expression of microRNAs in certain circumstances can also lead to disease. So cancer is a nice um, model system to consider with regards to this expression um, 
profile and how different levels of expression can lead to lead to illness. The most obvious example being the targeting by microRNAs of either oncogenes, proto-oncogenes, or tumor suppressor genes uh, within within cells. So if you imagine a situation such as exists for the uh, microRNA 15A and 16 uh, molecules, which are known to target and downregulate a number of different proto-oncogenes in our cells. If the expression of these microRNAs is reduced or ablated altogether, then the expression of the target which they normally regulate will increase. And as you should be aware by now, Increased or overexpression of proto oncogenes can lead to activation and um, the rebranding, if you like, of those proto oncogenes to oncogenes, insofar as they will potentially start to cause cellular transformation and cancer. So, a loss of microRNA expression releases the RNA interference that normally would regulate the expression of these genes, causing their expression to become increased. Conversely, if microRNAs are responsible for fine-tuning, if you like, and regulating the expression of tumor suppressor genes such as P10 and RB2, and you overexpress these microRNAs, then rather than just, if you like, turning down the throttle a little bit on the expression of these tumor suppressor genes, the microRNA families involved could shut off expression altogether. And if you shut off expression of tumor suppressors altogether, then once again you tip the balance in the favour of cellular transformation and the development of cancer. So there's a lot of research and if you go onto PubMed and type microRNAs in cancer you'll find hundreds if not thousands of hits which have been published now linking microRNA expression to different types of cancer. So it's a big area of research and potentially a big area of medical importance. I mentioned earlier that the neurological diseases are also being linked now with microRNA expression profiles and there's some really interesting emerging data for the fragile X mental retardation protein, which is the gene product that um, is associated with the neurological disease or the autism like disease, Fragile X. Turns out that this FMRP protein actually associates with the risk complex in um, Drosophila, at least. I think it's also been shown to associate with the risk complex in human cells as well now. But certainly in Drosophila, there's clear evidence showing that. FRMP physically interacts with the argonaut protein and these data are shown in these co-immune precipitation experiments here. So what the, what the researchers have done is they've artificially expressed in bacteria a version of the Drosophila FMRP protein here fused to a GST epitope tag. We talked about epitope tags in molecular genetics last uh, year if you recall. So once they've purified this fusion protein, this um, FMR1 fusion protein, they then use this fusion protein in co immune precipitation experiments to ask the question of whether FMR1 is able to interact with argonauts and other components of the uh, risk complex. And as we can see here, we see a clear interaction between FMR1 and several of these different risk associated factors. So it appears that this interaction between FMRP and risk is important at least in flies, in the development of synaptic connections, which is obviously intriguing as that would be the sorts of functions that we probably associate with the human FRMP, given its um, phenotype, which is, a, as I said, a neurological disease. So the biological importance with regards to medicine of microRNAs cannot really be overstated. Um, there's certainly an area that's really been heavily researched at the minute, and um, many of them are starting to be revealed as important factors, etiological factors in disease. Again, apologies for the animation. I'm just going to put all of these on here. So, this kind of goes hand in hand with the last slide, insofar as if we're interested in microRNAs from the point of view that they're associated with known disease, another aspect we're interested in is whether or not, as a scientist, we can use this kind of technology that the cell has evolved in order to perform experiments and maybe even develop, develop therapeutics to, uh, to fight disease. And um, for a long time now, for 10, 15 years, I guess ever since really the discovery of RNA interference, scientists have been using artificially uh, generated short interfering RNAs in order to shut off 
gene expression in experiments. Prior to this, control of gene expression in mammalian cells, in animal cells, was quite tricky um, compared to systems such as yeast and uh, bacteria. And um, it was work using antisense that kind of pioneered uh, ultimately the findings of fire and, um, and bellow with regards to the RNA interference. And um, it's now an exploitation of the RNA interference mechanism that scientists use in order to control gene expression when working with mammalian cells. Uh, the example I've given here is actually a commercially available vector called P-Silencer. But it's a little bit more complex than uh, some of the other systems out there. Some people choose to simply synthesize 21 to 23 nucleotide long short interfering um, RNAs which can be directly transfected into cells and will target um, given mRNA uh, targets depending on the sequence of the short interfering RNA that's synthesized. This vector system here chooses to express if you like a microRNA like transcript which can form a basic stem loop structure. So this is a lot more similar to what a, a microRNA would look like following cleavage by Drosia. It's got this two nucleotide overhang here at the, he at the end. So this is um, then would predicted but this will be predicted to be exported by exporting fibre into the cytoplasm, cleaved by dicer, and um, the guide strand would be inserted into the risk complex and go about the business of silencing the target. So there's lots of effort being directed at the minute with regards to trying to insert this, these sorts of things into actual patients from a gene therapy point of view. Uh, synthetic microRNAs and these sorts of expression vectors, be the plasmids or from viral vectors, is a uh, big business at the moment. There's a lot of people trying to get that to work and get that into trials. There's an article here that talks a little bit about that if you want to do some additional reading. Okay, so to finish with, I want to um, talk about a type of non coding RNA that we've known about for a while, but it's only more recently we've started to really appreciate the functional significance of these molecules, and that are the so called long non coding RNAs. So we actually talked about long non-coding RNAs, or at least introduced them, last year in molecular genetics. So I would advise you to revisit your notes from that module as a basic background to these molecules. I'm not going to go over that the same information again. But one thing to realise is that it's only really since the advent of next generation sequencing, high throughput sequencing, such as Dr Fessing talks about when he described the Illumina system to you guys a week or two ago, that the actual prevalence of these long non-coding RNA molecules became apparent. So it turns out, actually, the vast majority of our transcriptome, certainly RNA polymerase 2 transcriptome, is comprised of these long non-coding RNA molecules. Actual active messenger RNA, in other words, messenger RNA that's destined to be translated into protein, is a minority player with regards to the complete total um, if you like, mass of RNA transcripts which are produced by RNA polymerase 2. And it's still a controversial area what the significance of that observation is, whether or not these long non-coding RNAs are simply the byproducts of a sloppy um, transcriptional machinery or a non-specific transcriptional machinery, uh, or whether they've been transcribed for a specific defined function. I tend to favour the latter because I just don't, I don't think the cells generally evolve systems as complex as RNA polymerase 2 immediate transcription and then just have it for no reason whatsoever have you you know have, have that system transcribe in the majority these inverted commas useless molecules that just doesn't make sense to me personally but it's it's still argued by some people that these these are just transcriptional noise these long coding RNA transcripts but certainly for one or two of them now we've got very defined functions so some of these long non-coding RNAs, de RNAs definitely are doing something. The argument is, are they all functionally important or are the vast majority of them actually just byproducts and they aren't doing anything in the cell? And we, co we considered some of those arguments last year, so I don't want to go over them again. Just to give you briefly though, a little, um, if you like, snippet of what functionally these molecules uh, might be doing in the cell. And this is quite a basic overview. People have described all sorts of functions to them, but this is relevant for the examples we're going to talk about in the next slide or two. So here, long non-coding RNAs are produced, and they're either acting as a scaffold, linking together different proteins, or they're acting as a guide in order to bring 
different proteins to a certain location, such as the promoter region of a gene that's going to be um, transcribed. So, keep that in mind, let's look at two examples, which we know definitely are um, functionally important to the cell. And the first of those is the long non-coding RNA hotair. So the hotair gene is actually located on the HOC-C cluster, and it encodes a long non-coding RNA, it encodes it in the reverse, off the reverse strand here. And the hotel long non-coding RNA, which is shown in this cartoon here, then acts in a, tr in a trans fashion to regulate the expression of the HOX-D gene cluster. So HOTE doesn't regulate the expression of its neighbouring genes in the HOX-C. If it did, it would be considered a cis operating system, after a fashion. But it operates in trans, it operates on a different target, and that target is the HOX-D gene cluster. So how does it actually regulate the expression of these HOX-D genes then, during skin development? Well, it actually does this by fulfilling both of those proposed function, functional models from the previous slide. So firstly, Hox, uh, sorry, firstly, Hoad's hair can act as a scaffolding molecule insofar as it can interact with two different protein complexes. The first being the polycomb, polycomb repressive uh, complex 2, PRC2, and the second being a complex of proteins which includes a histone demethylase LSD1. So Dr. Fessing, I believe, mentioned uh, PRC2 and polycomb proteins in his lectures. Effectively, these polycomb repressive complexes are a group of proteins that, when associated with DNA, transcriptionally silence those DNA molecules by altering chromatin structure. They actually lead to the specific type of methylation occurring on lysine 27 of the histones within the chromatin. And the five prime end of HOTE can interact with this PRC2 complex. And the three prime end, the other end of HOTE, can interact with this complex which contains LSD1, which is a histone demethylase. So this is a group of proteins that when, back, when associated with chromatin demethylate the histones, which tends to activate gene expression. That's the first function, the function of the scaffold. The second function is it can also function as a guide. Because not only does it interact with these protein complexes, it can also guide these complexes to the HOX-D gene cluster, thus regulating gene expression. And as I mentioned, this process is critical during skin development. But interestingly, it's also an upregulated process that's seen in metastatic breast cancer. So there's links again between this long encoding RNA here and its expression level and um, the development of certain types of cancers, in this instance, breast cancer. But what's interesting is the fact, I think, that the 5 prime end can interact with an, uh, a complex which shuts off gene expression. The 3 prime end can interact with a complex that turns on gene expression. So what you've got is a molecule that's really pulling the strings here and can turn off and turn on gene expression within this system, within this HOX-D cluster, uh, as is needed during the complex process of developing skin. The second example I'll talk about is a long run coding RNA exist. So, as I'm sure you're aware, in female cells, one of the X chromosomes is inactivated. It needs to be inactivated, otherwise the gene dosage level that females would have in each cell will be double for all those genes on the X chromosome compared with what male cells have. And that would lead to biological problems and, and physiological problems for the cell. So one of the X chromosomes in every female cell is always switched off transcriptionally, it's silenced. And it tends to be silenced by forming a heterochromatin-like state. There's just no active gene expression or next to no active gene expression at all from, from that particular copy of the chromosome. And exit activation is a really interesting area of biology that's been extensively studied. And it turns out that in our cells, um, inactivation occurs, or in animal cells anyway, um, mammalian cells. Um, let me rephrase that. Uh, placental mammals is probably a better way of, of, a, a, of bracketing and um, speaking specifically about the group of animals I'm talking about, because it's different for marsupials. In marsupials, the paternal X chromosome is always inactivated in female cells. In um, placental mammals, it's the X chromosome which is inactivated in female cells is determined at random, and it might be the male one or it might be the female one. And that random process is established at around the 32 to 64 cell stage of development, so very early on during development following fertilisation. And the interesting thing is that once this random pattern is established, 
every single cell that's derived from this very early blastocyst stage inherits this same pattern of inactivation. And that can be exemplified by this uh, tortoiseshell cat, this calico cat here. So the patterning of the tortoiseshell colours reflects X inactivation occurring at random during the very early stage of development, either shutting off, um, which either shuts off the, um, the gene responsible for the colour in the fur or leaves it switched on. And depending on which happens, depends on the pattern of colour that the cat's going to show for that particular location of its body. Thinking is that such randomised inactivation in placental mammals compared to what goes on in marsupials, for example, offers a selective, a selective advantage uh, for placental mammals as it prevents the unmasking of maternal x mutations by imprinted paternal X chromosomes. So, for example, if there is an issue with the female X chromosome follow fertilisation and every single X chromosome from the father is automatically shut down transcriptionally, switched off, then those mutations that might be present on the female X are going to manifest themselves throughout the entire organism. In contrast, if you activate, inactivate X chromosomes in, uh, at random, then such maternally inherited X uh, chromosome mutations may be masked to a certain extent by producing a mosaic animal, whereas part of the cells may be um, expressing that deleterious mutation, but other cells are not. And often that can lead to a situation where diseases, phenotypes are much more mild and these um, kind of mutations are, are, are more tolerated. Or tolerated better, sorry. So how does this switching off, this XM activation actually work and what's it got to do with exist? Well, if you look at this chromosome spread here, which is really nice, a really nice figure. This is a chromosome spread and the red marks, like kind of almost chains wrapped around this X chromosome here. Well, that red stain represents exist. And it shows that the exist long encoding RNA is actually coating one copy of the X chromosome completely um, in this actual metaphase spread of cells here. What's going on then? So how is an X chromosome inactivated? Well, what happens is the exist long encoding RNA is expressed from a specialised region of the X chromosome called the X inactivation centre. And I've put a links here to a couple of... Um, papers if you want to read about this system in more detail because I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about it here other than to explain briefly what it is. If you want to do additional reading around this then these two links are both excellent papers that describe the process and they're quite interesting. So following expression of exist long encoding RNA from the X inactivation centre, the exist RNA then decorates the X chromosome from which it was expressed and that's key. It doesn't decorate the, the other X chromosome. It will only coat and bind to the X chromosome from which it is expressed. And we're not fully sure, although they discuss it in the two papers that are, that are linked here, we're not fully sure how that actually works. Why the exist RNA never binds to the other X chromosome at all. Why it only acts in cis. But we think it might have something to do with another long encoding, long encoding RNA that's expressed from the X inactivation center called T6, which is exist backwards. You can see the T6 transcript here is reverse of the exist transcript, and this T6 RNA can actually bind to it and inactivate exist. So with the thinking at the moment, I believe, is that the T6 RNA is expressed at high levels on the inactivated on the on sorry on the X chromosome that isn't to be inactivated, and that prevents exist from binding to it. Uh, but it's explained in more detail in these two articles. The other thing that's important you realise <coughs> is that the RNA itself exists, the exist long encoding RNA itself is not silencing the X chromosome. What it does is, is it functions again as a guide molecule or a, and a scaffolding molecule to recruit other factors such as as friend polychrome repressive complex again to the X chromosome and it's these complexes that actually shut down and turn off gene expression by forming a heterochromatin-like state. And the final piece of the jigsaw, if you like, is how the memory side of this is established. So I've already said that X chromosomes are inactivated at random at the 32 to 64 cell stage, and then that pattern of inheritance, sorry, that pattern of inactivation is then inherited faithfully for every single subsequent cell division, which is quite impressive, really. How is that sort of transcriptional memory um, established? Well, it involves a number of key factors associated heterochromatin state which include histone hypoacetylation 
DNA hypermethylation, and importantly, an enrichment of a variant of histone called macrohistone H2. And this macrohistone H2 variant is exclusively associated with the inactivated X chromosome, chromatin, and not with the, not with the active X chromosome. So these factors together, it believes, which are recruited as a consequence of exist expression. <coughs> Excuse me, I thought to establish a chromatin state which is then inherited via memory, if you like, which is once set is can't be unset, and uh, every subsequent cell that's generated um, following this establishment of silencing inherits that, inherits that same pattern of X inactivation. Uh, and then when they divide and have two daughter cells, those daughter cells have that same pattern of X inactivation as well. So EXIST establishes which X chromosome is to be inactivated. It facilitates the recruitment of polychromic repressive complex, which shuts down X uh, transcription from the X chromosome quite quickly. And then lots of other things happen as well as PRC2 recruitment. Lots of other things happen to that inactivated X chromosome. Histone hypocetylation, DNA hypermethylation and macro H2A accumulation and it's these things which then establish the actual memory um, with regards to inactivation itself. So the final slide here I'm not going to talk through it's just a few more things that you should think about with regards to the possibility of developing um, our interference therapeutics. This kind of links back into the link to, to the article that I provided a link for when we were discussing artificial RNA interference and RNA interference as a research tool. So please feel free to do some additional reading looking at the therapeutic benefits of, of uh, RNA interference, but I'm not going to talk much, much more about that in, in this actual lecture. So just to finish off with a quick summary then. Understanding how these non-coding RNAs are regulating the cell is one of biology's most important challenges as things stand. There's a lot of money and time and effort by very intelligent people and eminent scientists being spent trying to understand how these molecules are regulating gene expression. Seems that RNA interference evolved as a defence mechanism, but in higher order organisms at least, that defence mechanism has been, if you like, exploited as a means of fine-tuning gene expression control. <coughs> However, part of that defence mechanism is retained in our cells via the peewee interacting RNAs, which appear to control the, the, the activity of active transposable elements. And all of this control is achieved via the RNA interference machinery to a large extent. Long encoding RNAs represent the majority of our transcription products, but we know next to nothing of the function and understanding what all these long encoding RNAs are doing, if anything, is again one of the real big challenges of the next 10 years in molecular biology. Certainly few of these now we're starting to understand in a lot of detail. We talked about Hotair and Exist. <clears throat> and finally, efforts are underway by a number of pharmaceutical companies to try and utilise these cellular processes, such as RNA interference and such as microRNAs, etc., um, in order to treat disease and, um, in some cases, try and cure disease via gene therapy. So, thanks for your attention. I hope you enjoyed the lecture. Um, I would encourage you to look at the core textbook, uh, Molecular Biology of the Gene, which has an excellent chapter on this material and uh, which was a good source of information when producing this, this lecture. Thank you.